These are particles of radioactive fallout. These few particles can't do us any significant harm. But should there be a nuclear attack, many billions of them would fall from the sky and settle to Earth, releasing radiation that could cause sickness or death in the area where they fall. Sauce. I'm Jake, and I am glad that you found me. I was kind of worried that I wouldn't see you again before the bombs drop. Things have kind of gotten a bit out of hand. You know, it's estimated that there are over 10,000 nuclear weapons in the world. 10,000! And depending on the size of the bomb, it could take as little as 2,500 to completely destroy all of North America, and 13,000 more to destroy the planet. <sighs> Man, it's beautiful out here, isn't it? I'm gonna miss this. All right, let's get inside. Come on! Ooh. We've all seen the footage of nuclear bombs being detonated, and it is jaw-dropping. The force of it, the power. But we've also seen the damage that it causes to the surrounding area. And we tend to forget just how powerful a nuclear bomb really is. For example, since 1923, there have been over 53,000 deaths from airplane accidents. There have been over 220,000 deaths from nuclear bombs, and that's only from two of them. The sheer amount of destruction and death a nuclear bomb is capable of created a new unit of measurement in the 1950s, a megadeath. One megadeath is equal to one million fatalities due to a nuclear explosion. To understand just how large and impactful an explosion would be, we have to look no further than the largest nuclear device ever detonated by the United States, Castle Bravo. was taken from an airplane at 50 miles. The width of the fireball at this time, about three seconds after detonation, was four miles. Castle Bravo had 15 megatons of TNT. The mushroom cloud went 24.6 miles high and stretched for more than 60 miles. You could see the blast from hundreds of miles away. But what we don't see is what happens after the initial blast. Once the cameras stop rolling, it no longer exists for us, but the effects of it are still there. In the case of Castle Bravo, 200 billion pounds of coral reef and seafloor were ejected. A large amount of it was pulled up into the mushroom cloud, becoming radioactive and creating fallout. As the cloud gets higher, the winds get stronger and carry the fallout away from the blast site, like radioactive seeds. Tiny particles of radioactive material can be pulled into the upper atmosphere and travel thousands of miles from the initial blast. That fall out from the larger castle shots blanketed areas of more than 5,000 square miles with radioactive material that would have been lethal to unprotected personnel. The island of Rongelap was 115 miles from the explosion and was evacuated two days after. White dust, fallout, rained down upon the inhabitants. Some loss of hair was a frequent symptom. The lesions appeared to be directly related to the amount of fallout deposited on the skin rather than to the generalized whole body radiation. They couldn't return for three years and then had to leave again because the island was still unsafe. What's scary about a nuclear bomb isn't just the initial blast. I mean, that we can see. It's the things we can't see, like the gamma rays or the radioactive dust that looks just like normal dust. By the time you feel the effects of radiation damage, nothing can be done to reverse it. Strontium-90 is known as a bone seeker and is released by thermonuclear explosions. It gets into the soil and is absorbed by the plants, then by the animals that eat those plants, and then by the humans that eat those animals. 
Once inside, it mimics calcium and starts to build up in our bones. Since it has a half-life of 29 years, it keeps emitting radiation, causing bone cancer and leukemia. And to me, the most unnerving part about nuclear war and fallout are the effects that are not immediate. The ones that you don't even know you have until it's already too late. Or the ones you don't know about because they affect someone further down your family line long after you're already gone. There's an obstacle course to recovery that survivors of large-scale nuclear attacks face. It goes from the first one to two days with blast and thermal, and then it can go all the way from two generations to several generations with genetic effects. With these bombs, the intent is not just to destroy everyone within the blast radius, or everyone who dies within a few days from radiation poisoning. It's to destroy everything they have ever known, to make their lives unlivable. As President Eisenhower said, you cannot have this kind of war. There just aren't enough bulldozers to scrape the bodies off the streets. And there is something more crippling than actually detonating a nuclear bomb, the idea of detonating. During the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, it was more about the capabilities and intentions the enemy thinks you have. It becomes a war of persuasion over a war of action. But there is another tactic, a doctrine of military strategy that boils down to, if you shoot at me, I'll shoot at you. But in this case, if you fire weapons of mass destruction at me, I will fire all of mine at you to make sure that neither of us wins, that everyone loses. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? But it's not crazy. In fact, it's mad. Mutually assured destruction. People receiving 200 Rentkins or more in a short period of time will get radiation sickness. Those receiving 600 or more in a short period of time will die. For your protection, shelter is the answer, since highly dangerous doses can be produced by fallout radiation. But how long would you have to stay underground? And would you even be safe there? Because you could always find yourself meeting a nuclear bunker buster. gonna be honest with you. Surviving a fallout isn't really the question. Of course you could survive given the right preparations. Humans are resilient and will persevere through the toughest obstacles. A lethal dose of radiation wouldn't turn you into a ghoul. It would turn you into a corpse. So the real question that you have to ask yourself in this situation isn't if you could survive a fallout, it's if you'd want to. I guess it's about that time. Einstein said something relevant to this. He said, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Let's lighten the mood a little bit, shall we? How about some music, huh? You know, cheer up at the end of the world, why not? The world at war, the end is near. Oh, yes, I love this one. This is a beautiful day from Madame Butterfly. And in it, Madame Butterfly is singing about a dream that she had where she sees a puff of smoke on the horizon and through it, her future husband comes on his boat. He's there to rescue her, to save her from the life that she's known. However, we will not be saved and we will not be rescued. But I can guarantee on that horizon, we will see a puff of smoke. And, as always, thanks for watching. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? Hello 
again, two things for you. One, if you need some Fallout-inspired loot in your life, good news, there's a video right here of just that. It's on the new Dong channel. Things that you can do online now, guys. If it's something you can buy, an app you can download, cool websites to check out, it is a Dong. And the channel features myself, Kevin, and Michael, so you should go give it a look doodle Also, the last thing is, there's a new Vsauce holiday box, this time powered by Geek Fuel. It's amazing. It's gonna be filled with exclusive Vsauce things, a lot of really cool science gear, and most importantly, all the Vsauce proceeds go to Alzheimer's research, so you're helping a good cause while getting some cool gifts. Okay, I'm out of things to say. Thanks for watching.